Let's take a look at Lake Erie. Lake Erie is a large body of water, one of the Great Lakes, and it is fed by the many creeks and streams and rivers in its watershed. And if we take a look at my rough sketch, you see an area of city right here. Okay, there's a big city there in that watershed. All right, there's another city right here. And then what I'll tell you is that there's farming activity all throughout these watersheds. Okay, lots of farming activity in the watersheds and the good rich soils in and around the Great Lakes. So what happens is over fertilization by the farmers. Okay, let's say this field up here has been fertilized and it recently rained and those excess nutrients that weren't absorbed into the soil will run off into the creeks and streams and find their way down into Lake Erie. Or there's urban pollution and industrial pollution that'll find its way into the creeks and streams and down into Lake Erie. Nitrogen, phosphorus, when used excessively and when they find their way to where they're not supposed to be, become pollution. The impact of that is, what, is what's called cultural eutrophication. Cultural eutrophication is a process, it's an environmental impact. And you see here these algae blooms. Okay, this green patch here, this green patch, these are algae blooms. As seen in this satellite image, the nutrients, the, the phosphorus and the nitrogen that's getting into the lake to Lake Erie is causing large scale blooms of algae. Now what's that gonna do? That's gonna block sunlight from getting down into the lower levels so that the plants and organisms in the lower levels of the lake are going to suffer from a lack of sunlight and that's also gonna lead to dead zones. Okay, where this algae is, it's in danger of becoming a dead zone. Okay, so what does that mean? This image explains it very well. Cultural eutrophication, when nutrients enter the water, place where they're not supposed to be, it'll cause an algae bloom. And that algae, while it's on the surface blooming, will block light and not allow plants and organisms at the bottom levels to obtain that light. So you'll have a die-off of plants. All right, which goes up the food chain and leads to a die-off of organisms. More importantly, as that algae dies in colder weather, so this is seasonal, this process, as that algae dies and sinks to the bottom, you'll have a buildup of the dead algae on the bottom. The dead algae is consumed by bacteria. That bacteria consumes oxygen when it consumes the dead bacteria. So we'll have a decrease in the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water. A decrease in dissolved oxygen, okay, what, what needs dissolved oxygen in water to live? Anything, any aquatic animal, any fish needs dissolved oxygen. If you take away the dissolved oxygen, you have anoxic water, which leads to dead zones. And that's cultural eutrophication. So just to recap, nutrients enter the water, all right, and it causes an algae bloom. That algae dies and sinks to the bottom of the lake, where other bacteria start consuming that dead algae, and it takes out the dissolved oxygen in the water. The bacteria consumes the dissolved oxygen, leading to what's called an anoxic situation. Animals need oxygen to breathe, therefore you have dead zones. All right, culture eutrophication is a big, big problem in our nation's and in our world's waterways. Take a look at the left, you have a normal lake. No nutrient pollution. Lake on the right, there is significant algal blooms, significant nutrient pollution. Here's another picture of an obvious, obviously a wealthy area. Well, I'm sure when these homes were built and they built their, their docks, there was no nutrient pollution and it was probably very beautiful. There was probably a lot of swimming going on. But now, due to some type of local nutrient pollution, there's algae blooms and it's probably pretty gross to go in the water. Maybe their property values declined a little bit. A lot to think about with this, with this problem. And here's a picture of a dead zone. 
and fish who found themselves in an area with not enough dissolved oxygen and they basically suffocated. A couple case studies in cultural eutrophication. This is happening all around the world, but think about this process in the heartland of America. Okay, all the corn fields, all the bean fields where the food of the, the nation are grown. Imagine the amount of fertilizers that are applied to the farm fields in these areas. If excess fertilizer is used, it can very easily run off of farm fields during storms or during erosional events into creeks and streams. All right, those creeks and streams are going to take those nutrients to the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River is going to dump those nutrients into the Gulf of Mexico. So what we're seeing is a gigantic dead zone due to excessive nutrient pollution right at the base of the Mississippi River. Okay, and it's due to excessive use of fertilizers all in these agricultural regions. All right, and there's also industry in here in cities and towns that also run off into our creeks and streams and get into the Mississippi River. At the bottom there you see the worst hit regions. This big giant dead zone. Okay, this is where a lot of our fishing comes from. The shrimp industry has been hit down here. All right, so think of the economic situation of these areas where these fishermen used to have a nice fishing industry and now due to a lack of dissolved oxygen, here's our little scale here, there's dead zone at the base of the Mississippi River and their economy is suffering. The fishing industry is suffering. Okay, so not only did those people have to deal with the BP oil spill and Hurricane Katrina, but they also have significant amount of nutrient pollution in their waters where the Mississippi River dumps into the Gulf of Mexico. Take a look here is the fishing industry, a couple images. You see the red area of dead zone. Louisiana is the state that's being hit the hardest, all right, because that's where the Mississippi River meets the Gulf. And I just like this image because it's a powerful image and it shows the cities and the farming regions in the heartland of America where nutrient pollution is significant. Okay, another case study is the Chesapeake Bay, largest estuary in the country. And here's Souderton, somewhere in here. And if you notice, if you drive just west a, a little bit, you'll get into the Pennsylvania farmland. These farms, if excessive nutrients are being used, fertilizers and so forth, they'll get into the creeks and streams, which will get into the Susquehanna River, which will get into the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So it's the Pennsylvania farmers who are somewhat contributing to cultural eutrophication in the Chesapeake Bay. Okay, so what comes out of the Chesapeake Bay? You have Maryland crab. So the fishing industry is suffering, and so are local economies and so are prices at the market for when it comes to fish coming out of the Chesapeake Bay. Okay, so that's another case study in cultural eutrophication. Let's take a look at a so satellite image. Here's the Chesapeake Bay. Here's the Delaware Bay. You can see eutrophication occurring off the coast of Massachusetts. Big algal blooms off of North Carolina. Okay, all these waterways reach the ocean. There must be farms and cities where there's excessive run nutrient runoff getting into the to the waterways. All right, and you can see up here too, even Lake Erie is up in here. Big, big problem. Okay, so let's take a look at the sources of nutrient pollution. I kept pointing a finger at agriculture, but they're not the only ones who are contributing to this problem. There's a lot of, of sources of nutrient pollution, so let's go through the major ones. Okay, and here you go for your notes. The agricultural sources are chemical fertilizers and manure. All right, we're seeing an increase in aquaculture, which is fish farming. Urban and industrial sources of nutrient pollution. And then our continued reliance on fossil fuels adds nitrous oxides to the atmosphere, which leads to acid rain, which comes back down and pollutes our, our waterways. Let's go through these sources of nutrient pollution. Here you go. The agricultural sources again are chemical fertilizers that can be used as sprays. If that spray, let's say that farmer applies today and tomorrow it rains, a lot of those nutrients can very easily wash into a nearby stream. All right? Or if too much is used and it gets down into the groundwater, it can travel through the groundwater to a local stream. All right, here's a farm field at the bottom here that looks like corn has been planted. 
All right, and I, sh I show that picture because the soils there are dry and most likely depleted, so a farmer would have to spray. And if you see, there's, there's a little hill here that's coming down towards you. All it would take was, would be a little bit of a rainstorm, and the water would run down through here, taking any excess nutrients off. So the contour of the land could aid in the runoff of excess nutrients. And then I have this limit, little image here on the right. And this is part of the problem here. And part of our MO, if you will, in America is to not solve the problem at its source, but instead treat the issue when there's problems. So for example, we have a problem with lack of nutrients in the soil. So what we're going to do is we're going to spray chemical fertilizers. All right, and that allows plant nutrients into the soil that goes right into the plant. All right, that's good. But instead, what we should be doing is building better soils and practicing better soil management because if you did that, there would be no need for chemical fertilizers. For this side, you would have to spray chemical fertilizers every year. The plant would take those nutrients, grow, and get harvested. The next year, you'd have to spray more chemicals. The plant would grow, get harvested. Then the next year, you'd have to spray more chemicals. So in this picture, you'd have to spray chemicals every year. On this side, if we treat the soil with organic matter, rich decaying organic compost, which would provide soil nutrients to the soil, kick-starting the valuable microorganisms we need, it would provide the plant nutrients to the, to the plant, the plant would grow, and we would harvest it. But instead of spraying chemical fertilizers, that organic matter is still there and the organic fertilizer would continue to provide all these things, the, the organisms, the nutrients, the nitrogens and the phosphorus that we need. On this side, if we fed the soil, there would be no need for chemical fertilizers on a yearly basis. Over here, if we feed the plant, then we need to fertilize year after year after year after year. Okay, so we need to reduce the amount of materials we use, not increase. All right, so what is fertilizer exactly? Fertilizer comes as either a spray or granule, all right? And you'll see a number, 5, 10, 5. It could be 10, 10, 10 down here. All right, and that relates to the percentages of nutrients in each bag. All right, in this case, 5 refers to 5% nitrogen. The 10 refers to the amount of phosphorus. And then the third 5 refers to the potash, which is potassium, all right? Things that use potassium. All right, if you're eating carrots, beets, and potatoes, you're getting the necessary potassium you need. At any rate, you want to know what those numbers mean, and it's the percentage of nutrients in that particular bag or batch of fertilizer. All right, when you apply miracle Grow, you're doing that. There's a percentage of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in that miracle Grow. Okay, you're giving your plant a dose of nutrients. All right, so think about the amount of fertilizer, chemical fertilizer, used every year in America's heartland agricultural industrial scale we're talking about tremendous amounts of fertilizer to grow all the corn all the beans all the necessary crops that we need as a country okay if you look on the back of any food product there's either high fructose corn syrup or hydrogenated soybean oil in it there's a good chance that those one of those things is in it for those things you need corn and you need soy those are the two biggest crops grown today and we grow them by the thousands and hundreds of thousands of acres. That takes tremendous amounts of fertilizers. Okay, the soy you can argue is a legume, right? But the amount of corn fields we use for corn is incredible. So that's chemical fertilizers. Let's move on to a different type of fertilizer or a different type of agricultural source, and that's manure. We're talking about the NH4, all right? Ammonium. Ammonium will poison a plant if it gets a straight dose. There's nitrogen in it, but it needs to be put into the soil where there's healthy bacteria to break it down and then to fixate oxygen on there to get it to a nitrate. But here you have a situation with a, a cattle ranch and the waste product, that ammonium, is washing out of the cattle ranch and probably into a nearby water source or it's being carried to a larger water source and possibly contributing to eutrophication. Sometimes it can percolate into the soil depending on the soil qualities or it can run right off the surface. All right, so manure needs to be managed properly. All right, manure is also used as a fertilizer. 
Okay, and it's very common to take that manure, that NH4, and apply it to the soils. And then as the farmer plows this under, it'll get into the soil where bacteria could then, could then convert it all right, to the necessary nutrients we need. So manure as fertilizer is perfectly fine unless it's applied on a day before it rains. And then that manure runs off into a nearby stream where it contributes to eutrophication. You can see this farmer here put a series of hay bales to help stop the runoff in this area where it looks like it's eroding down slope into the nearby stream. All right, so there's a lot of regulations on farmers. They can apply manure as fertilizer, but they have to do it and they have to record that they've done it in a week where there's no rain or a 10 day period where there's been no rain or no rain in the forecast. So you have to be very careful. Taking a look at this map here, manure nitrogen runoff vulnerability. All right, where's the most vulnerable for nutrient runoff? And if you look, here's Souderton in eastern Pennsylvania. We're in an area of deep red. And it doesn't take long. I mean, it, you, right here in our district, there's rich farmland. If you go out into Lancaster County, tremendously rich soils. But those soils are in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, right, in the Delaware River watershed. So that makes us vulnerable for manure runoff, nitrogen runoff. Okay, we have farms and we have a valuable waterway. All right, let's take a look at the third source of nutrient pollution, aquaculture, fish farming. Okay, and fish farming is basically just that. You're farming fish for industry, right, to be used and sold as food. All right, and it's usually just some type of container that holds a lot of fish. And that fish produce waste. So all these fish in a small little contained area is going to produce waste, which sinks to the bottom of this waterway and acts as pollution in the environment. So here's a little image. You can see the fish all in here, and he's feeding them. And they're all loving life in this small contained area. But their waste is sinking to the bottom and building up at the bottom of the lake and you have a buildup of fish sewage which creates a dead zone above that waste. Okay, elevated levels of organic matter and nutrients can lead to algal blooms that cause dead zones. All right, this stuff is decomposing. The oxygen is taken out of the water and there's a big dead zone there. These fish are okay because there's oxygen being added from the surface. All right, it's getting stirred into that surface water but under the water here you have this dead zone from the bacteria consuming the dissolved oxygen in the water okay and this guy here is our evidence that there's a dead zone here okay so here's a fish farm all right small contained areas but think about the amount of fish waste under the water in this area all right here's one in Thailand you can see they're getting ready to feed the fish there those bags are the feet are the food I just liked this picture it just shows the sheer amount of fish that were being transported before this truck overturned and dumped product. And then take a look at here, where is fish farming occurring? Here you have China and India, right, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Korea, Japan. We're talking about Asia. This is where this industry is blossoming. Take a look at the bottom. Fish caught in the wild has actually leveled off fairly recently since 1980, but the aquaculture industry, fish farming, has steadily grown and it's still growing today. All right, so it's a good chance that the fish we buy at our supermarkets have been grown in a fish farm or raised in a fish farm. Okay, so what does that mean? Is that good or bad? Take a look here. And if you're into nutrition, this will interest you. This is farm raised fish versus wild caught fish. All right, when it comes to the nutrition value, there's lower levels of protein and omega-3s. And if you know anything about nutrition, omega-3 is very important for our bodies. And the only place we get it is fish and eggs, unless you take a vitamin. So if you're not eating fish or eggs, you're probably deficient in omega-3, which is very important. In wild-caught fish, there's higher levels of omega-3s and less fats. Okay, so that's a little bit about the nutrition nutritional difference. Uh, the feed that they use to raise farm fed fish, they're fed fish meal consisting of conventionally grown crops. Okay, conventionally grown crops nowadays are those grown using fertilizers and pesticides and GMOs 
and herbicides. Okay, so what the fish are eating isn't something that natural fish eat, all right? And a lot of times it's corn and soy, things that fish aren't really meant to eat. As opposed to wild-caught fish, they find their own natural food, all right, in the wild. So are you eating a fish that's lower nutritional value because of what it's been fed, or are you eating a delicious, high-protein, high-omega-3, less-fat fish that was in the ocean or a waterway and eating its own natural food in the wild? PCBs, polychlorinated bisphenols, in farm-raised fish, these highly toxic compounds are eight times more present as opposed to low levels in wild-caught fish. You've heard mercury is in fish, and it is, that's true. And in fact, in farm-raised fish, there's usually lower levels of mercury found in them. So that's why in wild-caught fish, they say to, especially salmon, they say it's not recommended to eat wild-caught fish every day. Don't eat it every day. Limit your intake of fish that may have mercury in it. And we'll talk a lot about bioaccumulation and those toxins building up in our bodies. But if you don't eat fish every day, uh, you should be fine. All right, here's a big one, disease. All right, when you raise fish in a fish farm, when there's a high population of any species in one small area, there's a chance that a disease or pests can break out in that, in that population. All right, and what they do in a fish farm is they'll give it a dose of antibiotics. All right, and here's one that sticks out in my mind. Um, if you're eating fish that was raised in a farm, and antibiotics were applied in that population, you're eating the antibiotics. Okay, so that's a choice you have to make. Do you care that you're eating fish that was treated with antibiotics because you're consuming those compounds? All right, and there's no law or regulation that says that we need to know what we're putting in our bodies. So we wouldn't even necessarily know that that happened, that we're in consuming those compounds. Out in the wild, there's low levels of diseases. All right, there's no antibiotics applied to fish in the ocean. All right, no pesticides, herbicides, nothing like that. All right, and then environmental concerns. If there is disease within a population, and let's say one of those fish get out, all right, a farm fish that escaped could possibly contaminate a population of wild fish. All right, so that's one of the environmental concerns of, of farm-raised fish, along with the excess waste pollution and creation of dead zones. Just a little bit about the difference between farm-raised fish and wild-caught. I'm not trying to sway you, I'm just trying to make you think about what we're putting in our bodies and the environmental concerns regarding aquaculture. All right, here's a picture of a guy feeding the fish. You see the sheer amount of fish in this little area. Moving right along, we have two more to go. You're doing a great job. Urban and industrial sources of nutrient pollution. All right, you see this pipe here? We literally and knowingly and willingly are adding nutrients to our nation's waterways. Okay, I'm going to take this time to talk about what's called a point source and a non-point source. If you walk back this pipe and it leads to an industry and you can point to that industry and you can say that this pipe belongs to that industry and this pipe is adding nutrients and pollution into this waterway, that industry is called a point source of pollution. All right, you can literally point to it. You can take that pipe and follow it back and you know exactly where it's coming from. That's called a point source of pollution. As opposed to a non-point source, a non-point source of pollution, if you walked back this pipe and that pipe disappeared underground and we had no idea where this pollution was coming from, that would be a non-point source. All right, you might have cultural eutrophication happening downstream and you just don't know where the excess nutrients are coming from. You can't point to any one farm or any one industry or any one city. That's called a non-point source. All right, so I'll take this opportunity to introduce that concept, the difference between a point source. There it is. It's that building. It's that industry. I followed the pipe. That's a point source pollution as opposed to a non-point source. All right, urban sources can also be literally our exhaust pipes. Okay, you have an exhaust pipe here adding adding nitrogen oxides to the air which fall on the streets and then wash off into drains, storm drains, creeks and streams um, from urban areas. Also in urban areas and suburban areas uh, people have septic tanks that might be old and at this point leaking nutrients and human waste into the groundwater. All right, that would also be that's actually a big problem 
Okay, that's an that's also a, a source of nutrient pollution. Faulty septic systems. The last one, and we're going to wrap up soon here, I promise, fossil fuel sources. We continue our reliance on fossil fuels, the burning of coal for electricity, and the emissions include nitrogen oxides. All right, those nitrogen oxides get into the atmosphere where they react with water. All right, water condenses around a particle of nitrogen oxide when it falls back down to earth. All right, you have these unwanted, unwanted chemicals and acid rain. All right, I'll show you as we go through energy a lot of these images just our continued reliance on fossil fuels and their emissions that continue to spew into our atmosphere alright so just to finish up here these are the sources of nitrogen All right, they break it down between natural and human All right, these are some things you should know what's the number one source of nitrogen when it comes to human sources fertilizer okay that's the number one source of nitrogen so any excess fertilizer that's used leads to runoff and then nutrient pollution into our waterways and then fossil fuel burn fossil fuel burning all right contributes all right burning of biomass land clearing okay what you need to take away is this is the number one fertilizer use of fertilizer and that's just not agricultural fertilizer that can be homes all right developments all right, personal and residential use of fertilizer. All right, we need to be careful. All right, but here's the big number. The total number of human from human sources is 210 teragrams. Here's the natural nitrogen cycle. It handles about 140 teragrams of nitrogen. There's more nitrogen sources from humans than natural. Okay, that's kind of scary. Where this would be our total number if we were not here, now this is our total number we're adding a tremendous amount of nitrogen to our environment okay this is another example of one of those cycles biogeochemical cycles that we're tampering with we're adding through our anthropogenic sources we're adding tremendous amounts of nitrogen to our environment okay so what will the effects be we're seeing them All right, we're seeing dead zones in our waterways due to eutrophication which is leading to economic problems which is leading to problems in our environment, our economics, our politics, and so forth. You did it, okay? You made it through my lecture on the nitrogen cycle. I'm sure you didn't expect it to be that long. I'm sure you were kind of worried when you saw how long this lecture was and you went into this lecture worried that it was going to be too long and boring. All right, so I want you to give yourself a fist pump and I'm just gonna take this opportunity to wave goodbye to you and say that I'll see you here next time for another one of our lectures for the AP Environmental Science Classroom.